Um, we've got a lot of last minute joiners. So welcome to the Human Rights Protocol Considerations uh, session, the IETF 110 meeting. Um, it's gonna be a really good uh, meeting, but we have uh, two hours. We have two great talks and we have two drafts to discuss. So we're gonna not delay any further and go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a quick introduction to HRPC on behalf of me and my co-chair, Aubrey Doria, who's also on the line. Um, so if you'll bear with me, this is roughly how we're gonna divide up our two hours together. Um, at the end, we have quite a chunk for AOB because there's been some list activity maybe in the last six weeks that kind of goes beyond our current work. Um, it talks about some possibilities. So we wanted to make sure we left time for that and Aubrey's gonna chair that section. Yep. I need to inform you all of the note well for this meeting. What applies for all IETF um, scheduled session applies to this session as well, even though we're in the IRTF. Um, the first one that's important to note um, within the note well is on intellectual property. Um, and then the second part of the note well that we wanted to highlight specifically is the code of conduct. It also includes issues around personal information um, and also on that note, just to remind you that this session is recorded, it'll go up on YouTube next week or before. So please consider these things. Um, in the IRTF, so the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group is part of the IRTF. And we, along with the other research groups, um, support um, the IRTF and its uh, focus on longer term research issues that are related to the internet. And, and then specifically, I'll get into it later, but we are looking at human rights impacts in both directions. Um, we are conducting research. Uh, our drafts represent um, information that can be useful. It's, we're not developing standards here. Um, and we often then take this to mean we also wanna invite research being done elsewhere outside the IRTF to come into the IRTF um, where, where it's relevant, as you'll see with the two presenters from, from today. Um, so within the IRTF, we have this research group that's been chartered for a few years now to look at how protocols strengthen or might put in danger, actually threaten human rights. Um, and we take the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the ICCPR as our baselines for those standards. Um, and our objective specifically on our charter um, is just to first you know, establish and expose the relationship between protocols and human rights. Um, we focused, like we have one, we have one RFC out 8280, which looks at all of the UDHR, but specifically in our charter, we are concerned with um, the right to express oneself and the freedom of assembly and association. Um, we also are working on guidelines as it's been requested of us and as it is helpful to, um, to help with protocol development so that um, human rights are enabled um, and not threatened. And then we also work both inside the um, you know, IRTF and IETF technical community and then also sort of outside the space to sort of bridge um, the technical community and, and other spaces so that there's an awareness in both directions that this work is going on and why it's important. So we do drafts, we do reviews, um, again, inside and outside. We've talked about this several times in terms of the, any, you know, the AOB, the you know, expanding the scope, like how we actually wanna do more um, than just drafts. So the last four bullet points are an attempt to capture some of those ideas. There's a, you know, there's a film that was done some years ago that you can watch that sort of talks about HRPC's work. Um, We'll do, we we want to do more data analysis, which is what uh, Sebastian is going to talk about with the Big Bang. Um, and then, of course, Gershabad's work around the guidelines is very much about, um, you know, reviewing um, and analyzing protocols existing and, and otherwise. Um, these are the major milestones to date. We'd like to add some more of these um, as our as, as work on draft association, draft guidelines, you know, really starts to pick up. Um, and the Big Bang is also, I think we should add Big Bang to this at some point with a date, because um, that's been a major milestone. Um, and then just to remind everyone of where we are now. Go 
it. Uh, we have two active drafts um, that we're going to talk about today. Uh, they're out of order for the way that we're going to address them in the agenda, but we're going to be talking about the guidelines uh, for human rights protocol considerations that Gershbad's been leading on. Um, and then we'll also talk about the freedom of association draft that Niels has been leading on, but that has had several authors. And a lot of, uh, well, both actually have had quite a lot of list discussion lately. Um, I'll just make a note that those on the list will have noticed there's been a great deal of activity this week. I would admit as a co-chair, I've not been able to keep up with those um, discussions as I would li have liked to given their volume, but it's just because it's IETF week and I've been in a lot of sessions as I know most of us are. So not to say that we hopefully can bring in those conversations today. Um, they've not been addressed by the authors, I know for sure. Um, and, but we can also then, of course, commit to continuing those discussions on the list and we'll get to that when we already in the agenda. So um, if you're all still with me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our first speakers. I'm really excited about this. So um, Joanne Yates is Sloan Distinguished Professor of Management Emerita at the MIT Sloan School of Management. She studied the history and contemporary use of communication and information technology in firms. And Craig and Murphy, the co-author of the book Engineering Rules, um, is Betty Freyhoff Johnson, 1944 Professor of Political Science at Wellesley College. He's the author of, or he's a scholar of global governance and international relations who focuses on the long connections between intergovernmental organizations and industrial development. Together, uh, Yates and Murphy recently co-authored Engineering Rules, Global Standard Setting since, 19, or since 1880, which I read, really liked it, and I'm really appreciative of the authors um, for responding to my request to have them speak today, because I think you all will also find it extremely fascinating from a variety of perspectives. So I'm going to go ahead and take down my slides uh, and let Joanne get situated and turn over the platform. Thank you. I'm going to share my video. Share my video. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, Mallory, for that introduction and. Craig and I, here, here's Craig, he's my husband as well as my co-author, <laughs> are very pleased to be uh, speaking to you about uh, our, our work on standards in the public interest um, today. It's based on our new book, The Engineering Rules, Global Standard Setting Since 1880. And this book uh, focuses in particular on, it, it starts in 1880, it comes clear up to the the present, and I'll get back to that, but it focuses particularly on private voluntary consensus-based standardization, so non-governmental. And if you think of it as, if you think of standardization as on a continuum with the market at one end and the um, government regulation at the other, private voluntary standards bodies are right in the middle, and they're incredibly important. They include things like IEEE standards, uh, uh, making ANSI, IEC, and ISO, and newer bodies like IETF and W3C. So this is where most of the action is on a lot of industrial standard setting, and that is what this book focuses on. So today, what we're going to talk about, I will start by giving you a little history about the birth of the standards movement, and notice the term movement because it was more than just uh, just happenstance, it was a movement. And and then I'll jump up to the near the present and talk briefly about the emergence of IETF and W3C. And then I'll hand off to Craig, who will talk about standardizing around social issues. So the birth of the standards movement. Uh, it, the, birth, the standards movement basically came out of the professionalization of engineers in the 19th century. So in industrializing nations of Europe, the US, Japan, uh, more and more engineers were playing a bigger and bigger role. And they started forming engineering societies. 
they saw themselves as professionals. They wanted, and they wanted to be seen as professionals like doctors and lawyers. Um, so they not only formed these societies, but they also sought ways to serve the public interest because they saw um, that lawyers and, and doctors in some way ser tried to serve the, the public interest and, to, and that that was part of being a professional. So the, the way they came up with for making themselves uh, clearly serving the public interest was through standards. So the first, in the 19th century, there were three sets of standards that emerged that had, these were before the first associations that were purely for standard setting, but they, they covered a set of issues that are typical even now. The first set was around steam boilers. If you look at the picture of the exploding steamboat in the lower left corner, there were horrendous, horrendous accidents through the 19th century um, around steam boilers exploding and, and doing just terrible damage, killing many people in horrible ways. So it, it was clearly a safety issue that needed to be addressed. So in the US, the, a bunch of scientists and engineers at the Franklin Institute, which is a proto um, uh, engineering society, came together and they worked out, spent a lot of time doing research and came up with a, a standard for making steam boilers strong enough that they would not explode. And these ultimately made it into law and, and did uh, immensely improve this problem. German standard setters also turned to uh, uh, steam boilers as their first activity later in the century. The second area uh, was screw threads. Uh, com compatibility issues. As it turns out at that time, you know, if you got a piece of machinery that was made by a particular machine shop, it and you stripped one of the threads on a, on a bolt or something, you couldn't replace it from something you had from someone else. You had to go back to the original place and have them make another one because every company's screw threads were different. So first in Britain, uh, the Whitworth screw was proposed as a um, standard screw by an, a mechanical engineer there. And then in America, William Sellers, who's pictured in the slide, um, came up with a, a better standard, as <laughs> is the American thought, um, for the American standard. Uh, both of these were fairly widely developed and they were, and engineers and societies helped publicize them, but they were, they were made by individuals, not by groups. So the next uh, issue the performance of steel rails on which the railroads ran, that became the really critical issue where you start bringing together multiple types of engineers uh, to work on the same problem because you had to have mechanical and chemical engineers involved. You had to have mining engineers as well as railroad engineers. So multiple uh, engineering societies came together and developed the the proposed standard specs for steel rails that you see on the right. They're, they're, their RFC. So this was the closest to what soon emerged as societies created solely for uh, making standards. So we get the birth of both national and international standards bodies around 1900, sort of this big bang and they all, all of a sudden came at once. The first national body was in Great Britain uh, founded by John Wolfe Berry, a, a mechanical engineer, a civil engineer who, who built bridges, actually. And he brought to, they brought together uh, people from five different, they brought together five different um, engineering societies and created a committee with all of them. And they developed a set of principles about how to arrive at standards. Um, they create the, the notion of technical committees in specific areas they set up, and they came up with norms such as you had to have a balance of stakeholders. So you wanted some of them to be from the manufacturing firms, some of them to be from the um, uh, purchasing firms, and some of them to be unaffiliated with either. So you wanted to have all three of those types represented and none of them over 50%. They also came up with processes that would lead to consensus and, uh, and, and in particular due process that guaranteed that everyone's ideas got heard they may not ultimately have been adopted, but everyone's ideas were heard. And this was very important and it, it lengthened the process, but it was important because it helped achieve 
voluntary adoption of standards, which was ultimately their goal, to get companies, manufacturers, and users to adopt them that way. So, and this became, this British body became the model for all the other national bodies. The other national bodies were, there was a little delay first, and then around World War I, a whole slew of other countries started developing national bodies modeled on the British one. But only five years after the British one was founded, the first ongoing international body was created uh, by electrical engineers. They were at the, uh, the cutting edge of engineering at this point, and they decided they needed to um, organize on, on a, an international level. And they had to come up with some new rules because it, it worked differently when you were in an international than national. One of the things was they figured out you had to have delegations from each nation that was, but you wanted those delegations not to represent the government. They were very clear on this and had big discussions about it and it's all documented well. They didn't want governments. They wanted standards bodies to be national standards bodies. In this case, the electrical engineering body from each country to say who should be the delegation. They also came up with the notion of one vote per country which IEC still uses today. Um, and the picture there is, is Colonel Crompton, who was the engineer who started uh, this one. Now with these two bodies, we now have the birth of the standardization movement. Standardiz standardizers formed a transnational community. That is, they were talking to each other across country lines. They weren't just being national, they were being an international community. And Charles Lemaistre was perhaps the head of all of this. Um, that's Charles Lemaistre right there. He was a secretary of the British body from the very beginning. He was quite young at this point. And in that capacity, he convened meetings of the secretaries of all the national bodies for several years in a row so that everyone was exchanging views. Uh, he also was the, the first secretary general of the IEC and he kept that position. He was Secretary General from its beginnings in 1906 to in the 19, early 1950s, right before he died. So he, he really was, was the heart and soul of IEC during that period. And uh, here in this picture, you see him in the 1920s, uh, mid-1926, I believe, leading a whole group of European standards representatives off a ship in a harbor in U.S. where they were coming to attend uh, two uh, conferences, one to look at, one an IEC conference, but the other one a uh, conference to think about whether they needed a more general international body. The, the body that they formed would not survive World War II and is not important but at this point, but um, this was the first attempt at that. So these people the leaders of these organizations, and, and particularly Charles Lemaistre, shared beliefs that standards promoted both national and international values, you know, prosperity and national interests on the one hand, and humanity's interests and in world peace even on the other. So we can see Sir John Wolfe Barry, the, the man who started the British uh, group, he felt that this organization would help them in keeping the trade of our colonial empire in the hands of British manufacturers. So that was a national value. Comfort Adams, who was the head of the American national body, um, he was more, he was worried about the post-World War I um, labor problems in the U.S. and the, and the worried about what the, the Russian Revolution happening in the U.S. So he thought the best thing that could help this is productivity of labor. If you increase it, the pie gets bigger, everyone gets more money. And they thought that that would decrease um, the labor unrest. And he saw standardization as the key to that as well. On a more, um, on a higher level, Charles Lemaistre himself saw that the process by which they arrived at international standards was key also. Because it, it, to be a good standardizer, in his view, you couldn't just go for your own interests. You had to sink much of your personal opinion and work for the benefit of the community as a whole. And that he saw as something that would increasingly benefit humanity at large. So he had big, a big vision. Similarly, Comfort Adams saw that uh, international standardization 
would help with the removal of a barrier between nations. And it, it, was, it would also help them to, quote, attain that lasting peace for which the world longs. This is right after World War I, and he longed for peace. Unfortunately, that wasn't to be. But they had great beliefs in the value of standards uh, to do this. The, the final piece of the traditional standards system was put in place right after World War II, when uh, during the war, all the standardizers were focused internally on national standards and military standards. But the minute it, um, the war ended, they met in London. This is a 1946 meeting you see here uh, to create ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, uh, of which IEC would be uh, the International Electrotechnical Commission would be a partner and sort of the, the electrotechnical um, division of ISO is how they saw it. Lemaistre was a key figure in figuring this out. He also, oh, and here he is, he's, he's <laughs> old and a little short by this time, so you can barely see him between two front row gentlemen, but um, he really pushed during this period on inclusion. So he thought it was absolutely critical to get all the stakeholders back in, both Germany's, Japan, Italy, and also to keep the Soviet Union and the other countries in its, in its, its um, sphere of influence part of this as well. And, the, and IEC and ISO did this much better, actually. They did it faster than the UN did that was formed. They managed to bring everyone back in. So internationalism was a very strong value by this time. So now let me skip up in time uh, closer to our current era and, and look at how new standards bodies emerged around the internet. Here you guys are, IETF. Um, in the 1980s, as some of you will know, the, there was a networking standards war. And as uh, various organizations were trying to set standards and all kinds of people were working on it, meanwhile, um, TCP IP became the de facto standard because it was up and it was running and people could use it. So it became de facto standard. And that meant that IETF, which had been created in 1986 when, when DARPA spun off the um, internet from ARPANET, uh, it helped create IETF uh, to help keep tabs of the, the protocols. And that became the de facto standards body for the internet, which is very interesting because IETF was not directly influenced by these traditional standards bodies I've been talking about. It, you know, it grew out of a completely different tradition and it had a very different style from those, um, a very freewheeling style that uh, contrasts with the, the men with their high hats that we saw in the pictures. And as you all know, it, David Clark, articulated in 92, the manifesto, we reject King's presidents in voting, we believe in rough consensus and running code. And that meant that there were some unusual uh, characteristics of IETF compared to the other standards bodies. So IETF is open to all individuals, which feels very democratic, but it doesn't require stakeholder balance. So there's, there's not anything structural that prevents one company from sending all their people to a meeting, for example. They valued timeliness over complete consensus and over due process. They, the technology was moving too fast. Uh, it, ITF is global, but it, it lacked national representation, which had some advantages, but some real disadvantages. And in practice, it meant that for many of the uh, years of its existence, it was dominated by Western English speaking males. And one final difference is that there's lots of movement energy uh, I've discovered in, in IETF. People are enthusiastic about it, but they're enthusiastic about the internet. The internet is what they see as helping create world peace, not standardization itself. Soon we get W3C as well. Tim Berners-Lee formed it. it. He was familiar with IETF and the traditional model and corporate consortia, which also came in during the 80s. But he created his own uh, hybrid where he gave himself extensive powers um, and uh, he strove for a more robust consensus and provided limited due process where uh, he was you could appeal to him. So now let me hand this off to Craig who will talk about standardizing around social issues. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, I want to have a story that really starts around the same time as IETF and NW3C, which is the story of how the traditional standardization system and then a set of new bodies got involved in things like human rights and social issues and environmental issues. And there's a weird thing because it really starts with quality management standards, the ISO 9000 series, which were established around 1987. ISO 9000 was the first time that ISO created a standard that was about a business process rather than a standard about something like compatibility of, of, uh, of uh, objects. Um, ISO 9000, especially in the United States, tends to be mocked by a number of people. They're all good sort of jokes about how you can be an ISO 9000 certified high quality uh, astrologer, and there are quite a few, uh, a Buddhist temple, and there are quite a few ISO 9000 Buddhist temples, or a university like this university in Botswana, which was the first university, and now there are many around the world, uh, that are ISO 9000 quality uh, organizations. It's mocked, but it actually is, has an extremely important role in businesses, particularly in the developing world, where it's important for businesses to be able to show that they have a um, quality of, of one form or another. Consequently, another reason for this picture is the Botswana University is saying something to the rest of the world. The final thing that's really important about this is ISO 9000 turned out to be a great money maker for national standard settings bodies. It provided a way through a certification and accreditation that these bodies, which had always had trouble paying for themselves, had a way of paying for themselves, even in developing countries, again, like Botswana. Okay, as a consequence of the ISO 9000 idea and of a second thing, and this is my political science -y sort of thing, which is that around the same period of time, you get, start having the global manufacturing economy, but you don't have intergovernmental agreements to deal with the social and environmental consequences of this global manufacturing economy because the United States will not allow those agreements to be reached, starting really with the Reagan administration. As a consequence for companies that actually were doing things that uh, dealt with, you know, supported social issues, environmental issues, human rights issues, they uh, felt that it would be a really good idea to have standards where they could be certified for doing something that lots of other countries, companies did not do. And ISO started to get into this business of finding standards based on ISO 9000 that would allow you to say, we do things correctly environmentally, we do things correctly in a, in a social form. Oddly enough, though, ISO was challenged by many of the social movement organizations in these fields for not actually providing strong enough standards. And you start getting standards first in the environmental area, but then uh, also in labor and human rights areas, again, starting right in the 1990s that are higher level certifications and a whole new standards movement uh, around this. Uh, Alice Tepper Marlin, who's pictured here, is sort of the um, Charles Lemaistre, the guru of this, this. And in addition, finally, you get the United Nations system coming up with its own version based again on ISO principles. So you have the, uh, you know, now hundreds of different standards that, that are in this field. Um, there's, for a political scientist, one of the things that's the most interesting is that these standards are have a kind of uncertain legitimacy. It, one of the things that we know from a variety of different surveys is that despite the fact that these the standards that Alice Tepper Marlin's groups, ICEO, uh, which Hey folks, um, I think we lost our presenters. Unless that's just me. No, I think Joanna and Craig are gone, but um, 
We can wait for just a beat, see if they turn back up. If not, I think we're ready to move on. I do see Joanne here. Um, I would give them a second and then we may just want to take some comments if we're there. It's a little hard to understand you, um, Avri, but could you just repeat that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just thinking we could give them a minute or two, but also if there started to look like there might be some discussion, so if people had a couple comments to make, we could make that before jumping off. But they may be back now. I don't it know. looks like they're back. Sorry about hey, that. Hey, Craig. No, that's all right. You can just pick up where you left off. Where did where did we uh, leave off? I think there. What? Oh, okay. Wait, it's not the right window. Elliot says okay, legitimacy. Where you left off. Okay. So uh, I said that there are, are these new forms of standard setting by a variety of different groups, um, and one of the things that's, that's striking about this is that there's a different degree of perceived legitimacy of these different standard setting organizations. For companies and for social movements around the global south in much of the, in much of the world, the move or the standard setting that is considered to be the most legitimate is actually that done by ISO simply because the ISO always had assures through ba the balanced process that people from the developing world are able to take part. Um, so we want to just conclude with some general things uh, that we think about, we've discovered about voluntary standards and the global good. And we'll start by saying the general argument is standardization as the old standardization movement, the Charles Lemaistre people would say, really has been good for the average person. But the second and more important thing, I think for our, our work is that we've discovered that standardization has always had a social movement logic, that it's always been about people trying to change the world in the public interest. The process itself, and this goes back to the early ideology, really encourages people to act in the public interest, to come to per pursue the ideals as well as the economic interests that they might have as individuals or as their company. And finally, if you have further uh, interest, uh, please go, go and find the book. It's recently out in paperback, and there's a, a, a discount of 30% during March. Thank you very much. Back to Joanne. Great. Thank you both so much. Also for that discount code. That's gold. Um, you're, just so you know, your video's off if you wanted to work on, I think it might be a permission from your browser uh, issue. But um, uh, the queue can be open if folks um, have questions to ask. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, Corinne, can you, you could put yourself back in the queue. I did not mean to dismiss you. I clicked the wrong button. Brilliant. Go ahead. Go ahead, Corinne. Yeah. 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 Corinne. I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute, um, and had uh, well, I wanted to start off with thanking you both for this wonderful presentation. Um, it was really interesting to see the IETF in what I guess is the larger arc of standardization. Um, I had some specific questions about the assumptions that you make both about early and current standardization efforts uh, in terms of it acting in the public interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I do so partially from my own uh, PhD research on the IETF. Um, but I want to start with the older standardization bodies that you mentioned, um, because you very much uh, show how they are focused on world peace. Um, but it seems that this is really a sense of world peace within a larger consensus that the reigning system of empire and that the reigning system of colonialism was one to be kept in place. And it also seems from different um, images that you included that all of the people involved in these early efforts seem to be white men. Um, and that to me raises a question of the extent to which we can even argue that these individuals and these organizations represented mm -hmm. all of the public interest or very particular uh, geopolitical one. In, yeah. Um, in, in, likewise, 
we talk about this in the book um, and right. more sensibly. On the one hand, uh, yes, it, it was within their time, public interest as it was seen in their time by their class and et cetera. I think that's all true. Um, but one of the things that's been true about most of the literature on standardization since it done in the last 20 years has focused on um, how self-centered and, and uh, uh, non-public interested <laughs> uh, standard setting bodies are. And what we wanted to highlight in this book is that there, there really is a, a, a strong undercurrent of very positive values. Now, the values are in their time period and you know we can come up with examples where they didn't live by them and we can come up with a great examples where they did but so I, the, the other thing that i i, I want, want to add is um the the period that we we talk much less about in, in this talk which is from 1945 onward this was a period of time when because of some of the leadership of the iso or at, at the time um, ISO was actually leading, at least in, the, in a time period, the decolonization of global governance. Um, it, was, it was years ahead of the UN system, bizarrely. Um, and I, ISO worked from the very beginning to try to bring in engineers, of course, uh, from the, uh, the, col the, the, the colonies are, are, are around the world before they became independent, which is a little bit bizarre. Uh, the gender openness of, to the degree there is a gender openness <laughs> of, of this system, shall we say, um, it's great. <laughs> is, is uh, a lot later than um, the <clears throat> international open than, than the international openness. And one of the things that's, that I find interesting and peculiar, I teach at a, a liberal arts college for women, is that in the social, the kind of post 1990s social area, much of the leadership of the social standard setting outside the ISO system, and some of it within the ISO system is done by women. And it's certainly done by people from the, de the, the developing world. And part of the, um, it's something I'm not sure is correct, but I have a hypothesis that part of the reason the ISO standards are sometimes considered more legitimate in many parts of the world is because of uh, ISO is still more white and Western than perhaps the, some yeah. of the, the other areas. I'm just cutting the queue for those who are in after Elliot, um, and we want to move on to the next talk. So let's take another four or five minutes. If the people in the queue can keep it short, go ahead, uh, Niels. Thank you very much for this presentation and for uh, writing the book. Um, so uh, you write about the moral commitment of the social movements, and uh, you talk about the social around internet and web technologies and around environmentalism and corporate own responsibility. And I'm very interested to see whether these are different moral commitments and for different groups. So do they optimize for themselves and their customers or for a larger understanding? So this connects to the earlier question. And I'm also very interested to understand, do you see differences between consortia and former standards bodies and their interrelation? Mm -hmm. Say, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's certainly the case that that company consortia are much more concerned about standardization that is is, is really focused on the, the benefit to the companies that are actually in the consortia, and there are no rules or whatever that are that are designed uh, to to make sure that that is uh, of, 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 of <laughs> are, are balanced in any way. Um, the older standard setting organizations um, at least have these principles that are associated with balance and the public good, et cetera. Uh, the, and that's, they're not always fought, followed by, by any stretch, stretch of the imagination. Um, the, the details from organization to organization, from standard commit, from actual technical committee to technical committee, are things that uh, deserve a great deal more research. 
Um, and I guess that would be the place that I, that I would leave off. Yeah, yeah. We should probably let her go on yeah. to the next one in the queue. Sure. Um, you gave some examples of uh, standards that are defined that companies can adopt to show that they're kind of acting in some sort of public interest. Um, do you have examples of incorporating the public interest into more technical standards? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And um, so there were cases where indirectly that happened. So containers are the most important sort of the iconic standard um, set after World War II in the decades following World War II, container standards opened up the global market, right? And in the process of arriving at the standard, um, one company owned the IP for the corners that, that, you know, when you stack containers on a ship, corners hold them together. And one company owned that. And they had also lost out, actually, the, the standard that was established did not fit there. Um, the length and breadth did not fit there, what they already had built up an installed base of. So they were losing players. But they still, in the end, they gave up their IP. They gave up that patent to the um, ISO and let them, the engineers, members of the technical committee, use it and modify it for the, the new standard. So that is sort of indirectly an example the, I, th I think that the the big example in the in the early period of standardization that is until it you know until the 1980s was simply the notion that every technical committee must include people engineers experts whose purpose is to serve the larger right. social interests I mean, that, that's the original balancing rule that goes back to these organizations that were created around, uh, uh, around 1900. That there's somebody sitting there, not as a not direct representation, but, but representation by, by um, engineers uh, to reflect what is considered to be the, the, the at the time, uh, the general interest. This idea was powerful enough that in the early part of the century, many very lefty kinds of people, like the founders of the Fabian Society and uh, Torsten Bedlin, the American uh, leftist economist, actually looked at these standard setting organizations as places that were doing something that was more democratic and more in the public interest than what many governments were doing. I don't know that, however, that there's an example that's as explicit as what you what guys, you guys are doing now. No. <laughs> so, so uh, there isn't one that's that um, uh, salient. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I think this discussion could go on for such a long time. I know there's the chat is going and we've also got like other back channels. So we've just really and enjoyed your time. Get in contact with us directly, please do. Thanks yeah. so much for the offer. Um, we will share the link to this YouTube video next week. So folks that weren't able to register for the IETF can also benefit from the knowledge. Um, so thanks everyone. Thanks very much, Joanne and Craig. Uh, we hope you'll stick around. Um, Sebastian is going to now present. So while he's getting um, his presenter self uh, together, I'm going to um, go ahead and read out his bio. Make sure that's working. Hmm. It was not. Oh, right. We're battling for screen control. That's fine, Sebastian. Um, I don't need the screen to share your bio. So um, Sebastian uh, researches the political economy of technology. He's a research fellow at the Information Law Institute at NYU School of Law and the NYU Agent-Based Modeling Lab. He's also a research engineer on the EconArc software project. He founded the Big Bang software project in 2015. He holds a doctorate in information management and systems from UC Berkeley. And this work was also done prior at the hackathon um, at IETF 110. So um, 
I'm really excited to turn it over to Sebastian. Go ahead. Hi. Can you hear and see me and see the slides? Awesome. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is uh, this is super exciting. Um, and thanks for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I want to briefly say what is what is Big Bang? Uh, Big Bang is this software project that we're uh, talking about. And then I want to talk about what we did at this sprint, um, the hackathon at this ITF session, and then talk about where we think we're going with this project. Um, so um, Big Bang is a scientific toolkit for studying collaborative communities. Um, it started as a project to study open source communities, but it's really expanded and now it's primarily used to study uh, things like internet governance. And it draws from a number of different data sources, including email and Git repositories, and more recently, the IETF data tracker, and especially recently, uh, Listserv as a, a mailing list hosting platform. And then it combines those data sources with uh, data science tools, um, especially those uh, drawing on the, the scientific Python stack. So tools for entity resolution, social network analysis, uh, natural language processing, uh, time series analysis. We've got plans to include information extraction soon. So, so all the fancy stuff you think about with data science applied to um, these open uh, collaborative community data sources. Um, and when you pull that stuff together, you can do things like look at how different sort of online communities are connected. So this is one of the first studies done looking at a subset of the scientific Python community and the Wikipedia community uh, and the OpenStreetMap community and seeing where there were linkages between them. Um, and uh, it, it started looking at, as I said, those sort of open collaborative communities. And then in 2016, it was adapted to study human rights advocacy in the ITF and ICANN. Uh, I think I clipped the, the dates a little bit, but you can see this, so this is the timeline of commits to the project. So um, uh, then it, after 2016, it continued to be used as a teaching and research tool. Uh, it's uh, made its way into a doctoral dissertation. Uh, in 2020, Article 19 funded some improvements to its gender and affiliation detection, and also the, uh, the use of IETF data tracker uh, data. And then uh, this recent uh, spike at the end is um, you know, sponsoring the, the Big Bang Sprint and ITF, which has been a huge success. Um, there's now many different institutions involved uh, with this project, several different universities and um, NGOs. Um, and uh, we get some questions about this project. So one of the questions is, why is this uh, any different than the uh, existing sort of data tracker exposure tools like arco.com's RFC stats, which we love, uh, but we're, we're using a wider range of, of data sets and we're supporting different kinds of research questions um, because really we're, we're, we're uh, we're supporting social scientists that are studying sort of standardization processes and or collaboration. And we're also supporting computer scientists who are trying to develop new methods for, um, for using these kinds of data. And we're hoping that we, by having a community that brings these together, we can really do some social scientific and scientific advances. Um, and also perhaps some advances in activism and advocacy. Um, so, uh, at the sprint, which was uh, last week, we had a number of new participants in the project. There was a lot of work done on just basic maintenance, uh, keeping up with changing the software dependencies. Uh, we produced instructional videos for installation and usage. Um, we debugged a lot of stuff that was, um, you know, at, at, we, we ingest a lot of different sort of unstructured, sometimes malformed data. So we've got to work around that. And then we uh, introduced this new um, listserv data source, which is going to really help with applying Big Bang to other standards organizations like 3GPP. Uh, but we also did some some science, and that's what I, um, I'm really 
here for. Uh, and uh, some of the most impressive stuff was done by Nick Doty, who uh, just defended his dissertation yesterday and used Big Bang in his dissertation. And he did um, uh, an analysis of uh, remote meetings on IETF attendance, which was so interesting that it made it to the IETF plenary uh, yesterday. Um, and then we also did some looking into uh, how to track the influence and participation of different organizations in the IETF, which, uh, you know, got the blessing of Yari Arco of Arco RFC stats himself, and um, which we're really looking forward to doing more work on. So uh, Nick Doty's work uh, involves saying, well, you know, there's a natural experiment going on with IETF meeting attendance in that the last two meetings were remote. And you can look at speaking of, say, participation from the Global South and or, um, you know, other groups, uh, you could say, well, given where the meetings have been in the past, you see swings. So, you know, when the meeting is in Japan, uh, you get a lot more people uh, attending who are from Japan and likewise with you know, Europe. And uh, what's interesting is that in, with remote attendance, you stop getting those sorts of swings. Um, let's see. Uh, this was presented, uh, you know, in I think a clear way just at the uh, at the ITF plenary yesterday. So um, you know, you get a lot more people from Asia uh, when you're meeting in Singapore. But uh, maybe uh, the legitimacy of the standard setting process will improve if we're um, meeting more on Meet Echo, maybe. Um, the, the other thing that we were uh, very interested in looking at was organizational involvement. Um, you know, there's this uh, norm for IETF that people are showing up as individuals not representing their companies, but um, everyone knows that that's not exactly the case. Uh, and so while there is some work already on which organizations have been participating in um, sort of drafting uh, RFCs, uh, we, we wanted to look at email partly because that allows for comparison with, with other groups that don't have the same data tracker system like 3GPP. So um, digging into that a little bit, we uh, were looking at the domains of email. So, you know, everything after the at symbol, which theoretically could identify somebody's organization, like uh, if I have an email at nyu.edu that tells you who I'm affiliated with. Um, but there are a number of challenges. So there's both uh, in ITF, a, a lot of people that have their own personal email domain. So, you know, uh, said at bentall.com. Um, and then uh, there's also generic email hosting domains like gmail.com, hotmail.com, and where you have many different email addresses associated. And those people are affiliated with many different kinds of organizations. So. Um, we developed a, a new metric that's based on uh, information entropy, uh, talking about the domain entropy of a, of a, of a sort of email domain, um, which basically has to do with how wide the distribution of emails are in, within that domain. And um, we made some, we made some, uh, oh, sorry. And that was useful for um, filtering out personal email domains, but we're still working on this generic email host problem. I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, uh, so in summary, uh, we had a big success. We captured enthusiasm about the project from new contributors and users, and we found the broader IETF community uh, really surprisingly supportive of the project, and uh, that there's a big appetite for what I would call reflexive data science within the IETF. Um, and an openness to giving, uh, you know, Big Bang researchers uh, like a platform to communicate their results. Uh, and this is all super promising for, for the project. Um, you've got a bunch of, of plans uh, about where you want to take it as a software project, um, including, you know, refactoring of a lot of, um, of the old code. You know, it's academic code. It always can be, it always can be using, um, quality improvements uh, and uh, like containerization of the data exploration environment would be really helpful for bringing in uh, other kinds of collaborators who don't have as strong a technical background and don't want to do all the um, hard work of you know basic configuration installation. But what we really want to talk about here is um, sort of the vision and strategy moving forward, which has been sort of emerging over the past 
a uh, few weeks that we've been preparing for this hackathon, and especially as things have really gelled in the past week. So, um, so putting on an academic hat, uh, like I'm a I'm a postdoc at a law school, and uh, but you know, pick your theory of governance and power uh, in internet standards. Um, uh, my go-to is Julie Cohen's uh, Between Truth and Power, and uh, the the argument there is that network and standards, global governance is uh, circumventing the rule of law in various you know, nation states. And the rule of law is what protects human rights. So um, we should be somewhat skeptical about the move to networks and standards global governance. And that's, of course, a debatable point. But whatever your uh, position on it, um, you know, it is of interest that there's large multinational corporations active in these uh, international standards bodies, and um, that their uh, sort of foci of attention uh, shifts on a uh, multi-layered technical terrain, uh, and that activism and advocacy for human rights uh, has to keep up. Um, and uh, what we'd really like to do is translate these politically relevant research questions into quantitative analysis with Big Bang and allow for automated and comprehensive view across many different standard setting institutions to support uh, actionable insights vis-a-vis -vis human rights advocacy. So uh, for example, identifying who might be receptive to uh, you know, working more with the human rights agenda or uh, actively monitoring shifts in corporate involvement and attention over time. Um, so for example, I mentioned this email domain analysis. Um, uh, so for the HTTP uh, working group, uh, you know, we tried this metric and found, okay, um, we're seeing more sort of domain entropy for, uh, yes, uh, many of these uh, organizations, Ericsson, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, we get a lot of domain entropy as we would expect for generic email hosts like gmail.com and Hotmail, but we get the most domain entropy from google.com. Uh, why is that? Well, um, is domain entropy, you can think of as sort of like an area under the normalized curve here. So uh, when you have many, many different affiliated individuals with Gmail accounts, um, they, they, uh, many of them are very heavily involved. Those, uh, those top Gmail account contributors um, are working for different organizations. There's one from Mozilla, there's one from Nearform, there's one from, uh, ma many of them are up, acting, it seems, more in an individual capacity. And there's major differences in scale. Um, there's nothing like balancing out the scale of their participation, which is why you see this sort of very steep drop. This is their, the uh, number of messages sent, ordered, um, in descending order, uh, laid out over time. So it's a very long tail of low participants, You know, people that send one message from a Gmail account, and then one guy with a Gmail account that's uh, responsible for, you know, 80% of the messages from Gmail, okay? Contrast that with google.com, where you've got a lot of area under this curve because you've got you know 10 or so people all uh, participating at comparable rates, which is, um, if you do a lot of data analysis like this, you, you see that and you say, that's a very unnatural pattern. Um, that indicates a kind of corporate strategy of involvement. So, uh, so, uh, and this is this fits with intuitions crucially of people that do. Um, I, I'm not particularly a domain researcher in this area. Uh, I, I sort of build the tools. But what's what's nice with working with people like Niels and Nick Doty and other people who do qualitative research in this domain is like they they've got really strong intuitions about what this means. And you can say, oh well, this this quantitative signature seems to match. Corporate, corporate strategizing and involvement in an area that's different from individual involvement. And that's, uh, I'd argue, quite interesting. Um, so, so suppose we could track corporate power's influence with the IETF and where that's in friction with the norm that participants should be engaging in their individual capacity, not as company representatives. Now, and it's clear that there are people that are participating as individuals, and there are others that may uh, be more detectably uh, acting as company representatives. And what if what if someone were to, present, were to present that at the plenary? What impact would that make? Um, so uh, 
there's a lot we could do in terms of uh, scientific analysis to say, okay, what happens when prominent individual contributors change affiliations? Uh, what happens when they get involved with human rights? Can they can they be brought in? Um, uh, so those are those are exciting research questions. Uh, other exciting research and questions involve uh, patents. Um, you know, where can we anticipate patenting moves by looking at um, by looking at, at this data, but incorporating patent data with email address data is especially the case in other standards bodies where there's uh, uh, more IP stuff going on. Um, so I guess the vision is uh, we get in-depth qualitative research uh, and experience in the standard setting domains, which is really essential to making sense of patterns in the data. But then once we get a uh, a good looking sort of signature of uh, activity that's of interest, we can we can do a more active monitoring of standard setting activity and say, um, okay, this is where it looks like, you know, uh, you know, Microsoft or Ericsson is making a move here. Um, and, uh, and so ideally, we could we could turn Big Bang into a kind of strategic interface for advocates engaging with standards bodies, who's gaining power, who's making moves. And, and if we continue to, um, you know, uh, get traction within the ITF community, those results could be uh, presented uh, to ITF as interventions. Uh, and that's itself a very interesting, um, you know, at the very least qualitative uh, probe, if not, um, you know, effective advocacy. These are these are all um, issues on which I'm not, I have to say, I'm not an expert, but this is what, um, this is what we're talking about within the Big Bang community about where we want to move forward. So, um, I think what, what we'd really like to see is uh, you know, we'd love to get continued support from NGOs to maintain a regular presence uh, at IETF hackathons. Um, and then um, use the, those hackathons to push forward the idea of a sort of a vehicle of data-driven advocacy within technical communities. Uh, maybe you know, submitting more data visualizations to the plenary talks to increase the profile of the project. And um, and then also to do comparative analysis between different standards groups to inform scholarship and new approaches uh, for human rights initiatives. Um, that's the idea. Um, if you'd like to get involved, there's information about how to join the mailing list on the GitHub repository page. Uh, the mailing list is probably where we have most of the discussion. There's also um, it's also a good idea to reach out to Niels who. Um, does a lot of the you know uh, organizing around this, uh, and you can also just purchase, uh, look, work with the GitHub issue tracker directly. Uh, that's where we're having most of the the technical uh, conversation. Uh, with that, that's that's the talk. And so I'm really happy to discuss it with you. Excited to hear about the tool and how it works, but I love that we also got a huge dose of like strategic thinking about why this is really important for the community. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, Mirja, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for um, being here, bringing the data. Um, you're kind of preaching the choir here because I think the IETF is a community that loves data <laughs> and loves to understand what's going on. And we have all these interfaces, but we don't make good use of the data and we try a little better, but it's it, it, we depend on volunteers actually making sense of the data. So you're more than welcome here. Um, just like because um, I'm part of leadership and we talk very often about what kind of data we need and like how to understand what's happening. And one of the big questions we have there is usually um, how how get new people involved in the ITF? How long do they stay in the ITF? What's their motivation to stay or leave the ITF? So are we a healthy organization You know that is kind of future proof in the sense that we get new people in and 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 make them work in the IETF and make them or like make have them to make progress in the IETF. So maybe that's a question that if you take that on, I'm I'm sure there are a lot of open ears and would be interested in that. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. I'll probably file some issues um, to make a note of those as feature requests. Great. Thank you so much already. Anyone else want to jump in the queue? Um, 
we can, this will also, as I said before, after um, Joanne's talk, that this will be online next week for others to watch if folks missed it. So we'll probably do a round of promotion to that HRPC list about that next week. I thought it was a really useful talk. And of course, your slides are up. Um, folks can, of course, interact with this on the HRPC list. I think you're subscribed to that, right, uh, Sebastian? If not, um, you know, they have your email because I CC'd you on the message to the list about this. And also then there's GitHub where folks can ask questions, um, you know, um, add issues or things like that. So thank you. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you coming and talking to us thank, today about that. Thank you. Uh, super. So we're going to continue with the agenda. Um, I just want to go back to it. Um, we're going to now uh, transition into talking about work that we have currently. Um, so again, those are um, the two drafts, um, guidelines, and association. And I see Gershabad, you are here. Do you want me to be controlling your slides, or do you want to do it? Uh, actually, that, that will be great. Uh, if you could, okay. uh, Let me do that. For some reason, it's giving me um, weirdness around sharing my screen. So I'm just going to do a really quick refresh, and I will be right back. Oh, you're going to do it. OK, good. I, yeah, I, I, can, I can try it. Did that work? Perfect. Uh, right. Yeah, is, is, is my screen available? Yep, we can see everything. Oh, Go ahead. Oh, uh, so yeah, this will be a quick presentation on uh, guidelines for human rights protocol and architecture considerations, which is a draft that uh, Niels and I are co-authoring. Uh, and Gershba, can I also just, I just wanted to, um, sorry, before you totally jump in, that Avery is the document shepherd on this draft too. So um, if you want to pause sort of at the end or at any time, like I think she has a few things to say as well. So just perfect, perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this document sort of went into last call in December, but we received a lot of uh, uh, reviews and comments. So just to recap, this is a document uh, uh, sort of proposing guidelines that network protocol designers and, and developers can keep in mind to uh, broadly be in, in line with human rights. And uh, this the document is practice-based and practice-oriented, so we want all the language to be aimed at people designing protocols. It is practice-based in the sense that a lot of the feedback has come from the people who uh, put these guidelines into use and review the drafts or uh, drafts that they were authoring or uh, someone else's draft. They, they, um, and, and this is an update to uh, RFC 8280, which had uh, a version of these guidelines. So uh, it, there were a lot of reviews. And, and uh, I, uh, while making this presentation, I thought I'd summarize some changes, but uh, there was no easy way to. They're uh, sort of all over the place. But, but uh, uh, I, I did send in detailed sort of responses to the reviews by Joey, Corin, uh, Fazana, and Bill. So uh, please do check those out on, on the mailing list uh, if you haven't. Um, now, uh, th there's, there's uh, like we, we do need more additional work on, and, and this is something that was the aim, but perhaps we're not meeting very clearly now, which is all the questions will now be aimed at protocol developers. and. They'll be uh, solution oriented, and, and as Bill said, they, so some of these guidelines still read and explanations read as criticism of existing practices rather than guidance. And uh, there's also a very detailed uh, re review by Professor Sandra Brahman, Bill, uh, which uh, asks a lot of critical questions about the theoretical framework we've chosen and, and how we chose to represent certain documents. Uh, so so the, this is coming in the next version. Um, and uh, one of the open questions where, uh, at least uh, for me, it was hard to guess where the group consensus was, was on a section on attribution and legal remedy. And currently, uh, in, in the last update, this was uh, 
changed very to very close to what Prasanna had suggested on the list. And and there's been a, a couple of emails on on that after uh, the the new update was pushed. And uh, currently, I'm I'm of the opinion of like adopting the text that Elliot Clear had proposed on on email, uh, which. Uh, so, so just to just for context, uh, the attribution slash legal remedy problem was that um, if the right to legal remedy is something that protocol developers need to consider, and in in case the answer is yes, then uh, they uh, it probably becomes a, as a prescription for including elements in protocols where you can trace content to their originators or or. Uh, it, it, all the content is perhaps linked to um, identifiers associated with the creator. And this, of course, uh, runs very contrary to privacy and freedom of expression. And in, in that sense, other guidelines on, on that, which are already in the document. So um, my my proposition is to change it to what Elliot proposed. But but I'm, uh, yeah, I if there is still disagreement, I, I, I will let uh, uh, like uh, I would love to hear your opinions on on that, and perhaps the perhaps Niels and the chairs and uh, others can also come in. Um, so uh, while this was in last call, uh, I, I mean we're still very open to feedback, and in case you want to send that to the list or step to the mic after uh, I stop speaking, and uh, there's. There's lots of drafts that are having a human rights consideration section, and and I I may have if you're one of those I may have approached you informally for feedback, but uh, still very uh, I I mean we'd love feedback especially from you, and after the last sort of detailed review, which is Professor Sandra Brahman, I think uh, uh, at least uh, I I propose that like uh, and maybe the chairs can decide whether we need another last call or whether. Uh, we're all set. So, so perhaps on on that note, uh, over to Avery. Gershabad and and thank you, Gershabad and Niels, for sort of the, the the approach you're taking to uh, responding to the comments. Very much understand the approach you're taking of sort of trying to keep it within the particular mode of this is addressed to you know, the, the developers and such that, that are using the, the guidelines. Um, and I very much appreciate also the number of people that sent in comments. Um, though it did take a while to get people started sending them in. And I was very remiss in not stopping the last call after two weeks, in which case there would have been no comments. And finally, at some point, it, it was sort of, um, you know, gotten started by, I guess, John Curran was the first one to, to say something and, and then it started. So hopefully uh, next time we have a, a, a last call, more people will jump in quickly. I'm of the opinion that, you know, you're really, really close. And, and in fact, I was thinking that I would be suggesting another last call at this meeting because, but but with a few things and especially with you now addressing some of, of, of Sandra's issues, I think your next, you know, your next release would be the one that I would look to do another last call on it. And because there's been significant change and significant conversation, I would like to do one. I would like to do one that was short and, and, and force myself to actually obey the two week type of notion and not let it drag on for a month or more hoping that people will comment. And what I'll really be asking is those of you that commented, um, you know, has it been dealt with? Are, are, are you okay now? Uh, but the thing I'd like to ask people to think about is some of the issues that have come up seem almost like fodder for a great new companion document that sort of discusses many of the issues behind some of these and goes into the, the great detail and the learning that people have gotten over the last couple of years of using the guidelines and such. But, but that's something more for our later conversation than this one. But I do want to not burden this document too much by considerations that, saw, that fall out of that, you know, motivation on this document that it is to it is to be thought of as, is it usable as a guideline? 
you know, we're not providing a guideline, you know, so much as, as providing that. So uh, if that's okay with people, that's, and, and especially if it's okay with, with the editors, that's kind of the approach I'd like to take moving forward. And I don't know if other people have other comments. But I just wanted to get that said, and I really do appreciate the fact that you 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 did not yell at me for 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 leaving the uh, the the last call open as long as I did. And again, thank the people that commented. Thanks. Do we have thank people? You, Mr. And, and uh, I mean, uh, glad as anyone else. I, I think during the last two three meetings, there were no comments and uh, uh, feedback coming in. So so glad to. Have received uh, the, that volume in the past few days. I, I, I think the idea of going to last call after we address Sandra's comment sounds sounds good to me. But I'll also uh, let let Needs come in if he has uh, any thought. I follow your people's leads. This is great. <laughs> Thanks so much. I don't hear Avri anymore, but that might be just me. It's same here, actually. Yeah. You know, it was me gesticulating with a with, with, with a closed microphone. Uh, apologies. I, I said I very much appreciated your slide about how difficult it is to do the synthesis of of these comments. I'm sort of been doing one of those in the background because it'll be a necessary part of the write up that gets submitted. You know, when this gets sent to the IRSG discussing, this is the document, these are the discussions, this is where it came out, you know, et cetera. The group went through its process, the group went through. So so I am trying, but I totally sympathize with you of sort of the, the difficulty of putting them in, in a chart, in a nice neat box. But, but it's one of the things that I've been looking at as well. Any other comments? If not, um, Gershabat, again, thank you. And I turn it back to you, Mallory, for the next one, or because I see no comments. Um, there is one more comment. Farzana, do you want to jump in the queue and send audio, or I could just read your question aloud, which is that um, what are we going to do to resolve the issues? So, for so, example, for example uh, sorry, we uh, just asked if uh, the text that he proposed and that Elliot Lear came up with are uh, uh, is okay, and uh, there will be a last call after we address the comments. But it would be great if we could make use of our session time to call, to build a consensus around that text because that part is particularly contentious. And as we all know, this is a research group document, so we all have change control. So if we all make suggestions. We can only make a document better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, completely agree. If, if the question directly relates to the sort of attribution legal remedy part, then uh, yeah, my my, uh, my proposal is to just adopt the text that uh, Elliot Lee has proposed. And uh, if you have two minutes, then uh, if there are any objections to that, then uh, we can. Certainly, we've, we've, we've yeah. got a few. It's good we to do talk have about. <laughs> Discuss them on the list in the meantime. No, I think we're going to spend the time on it. So, Elliot, you're in the queue. Do you want to jump in? Yeah. Hi, and uh, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, <laughs> the the virtual world that we all live in. Uh, I think the text that you're talking about is like the three word change that I suggested in response to John Coran. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. yeah, John sort of went to the zoo trying to, to trying to address the concern that um, that that he raised, and I, I was looking for the minimalist change that would that that would accomplish the same thing. So that that uh, just as a, by way of explanation, I you know the the fewer changes the better. If I you know if I can, if, as long as it's understandable and comprehensible, you know, comprehensible to the reader, that that was the goal. And, and it, it did come up whether the issue is relevant at all. I think it's uh, useful to retain that text and, and change it to what you suggested, just because uh, uh, we shouldn't avoid the controversial question. So, so just that.
Any other comments? Thank you so much, Gershavad. Thanks, Avri. I have a question. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I'm wondering on, on Farzaneh's issue, she talks about a meeting to resolve the issues. Hadn't planned on a specific meeting unless there were significant, you know, a significant number of them that required that. I haven't the impression yet that we need that. So Farzaneh, have those issues been covered or, or do you see it not having been covered? And really, if you could speak up, that would be helpful because really want to understand whether we need more in-depth discussion on any of these issues before this document. And that's where I also look to this notion of does this document need a, a theoretical companion document that goes into deep depth on these issues? And, and that's where I have my question. Yeah. I think I my suggestion would be characterized, and I don't remember exactly what I wrote. We can look at that on the list, but that it should lead to future work. That's I agree with Avery. I think it needs like this draft probably can't go into depth on all these sort of nuanced debates. Um, and we should have those nuanced debates in the context of another draft. It would be great if the if this document and a future draft were linked such that you know the research that we have done, on the guidelines has exposed a gap um, on a certain nuanced issue that when we then follow and take, you know, a deeper discussion about. I'm pretty sure that's what I said. So and, and. great. Um okay. Okay. Gershabad is just asking a really direct question to Farzi, and if you want to continue in the chat, that's fine. Um, but if the text proposed by Elliot is fine, we need to, I think everyone agrees perhaps, except we want clarity on your position on that um, before it gets adopted fully. Um, and we can do that here, we can do it on the list, but that's, I think, the only remaining open question about that point. It will be great okay. if we can do it, but then we don't need to organize an extra meeting and that will save people a lot yeah. of CPU cycles. Yeah, we can, but we need to be, you know, we need to prepare for it. Yeah, the Farzanay's question comment was I've extensively objected to that sex attribution, and people said I was not in the rough. So I like Ma Mallory's approach to be taken into consideration of, of the first. And, and I'm certainly very supportive of that, assuming we have people that really want to work on that uh, beyond uh, the, the email messages. If I may respond, so. The responses of John Coran and Elliot were to solve that. So people have been trying to approach that. And we're now asking Farsi, who did not respond to that, that we do not want to say that because she didn't respond, she agreed. So that's why we're asking. Yep. Good point. And I'll keep asking. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hello. Sorry. I, I managed to make this work. So, um, I don't, I, I actually responded to that uh, email about like Elliot and John Cran. To be honest, I am, I, I don't know, I have been like very vocal on having attribution with the text that uh, we have now is not, um, uh, is not optimal, it's not, even in the interest of uh, and uphold, uh, it doesn't uphold human rights. But I I responded to that. I, I don't know how many changes Elliot um, uh, Elliot made. What Mallory suggested at some point was to resolve the text to minimize and make it neutral. Perhaps something on attribution needs to be there to just to reference to what is already in RFC 8280, and even better to serve as a pointer to future work uh, for our collective understanding of attribution. So I did not see that comment be uh, implemented, and we still have that text about attribution and legal remedy, which Colin Perkins, who's actually in this meeting here, uh, since 2018, he was uh, objecting to that. I went and uh, looked at the mailing list. Sorry, Colin, I'm talking. I'm 
on behalf uh, on behalf of you, yeah, you can correct me. But um, so I think that Mallory's approach uh, in this email on February tw uh, sec uh, 2nd is, is very good. And I think we should just make the text neutral, say it needs more work, and then uh, continue in another draft. Thank you. And I did not see that happening, to be honest. Uh, if I may quickly respond, is that OK? Please. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, in my opinion, the current uh, text actually I, I thought would reflect more uh, 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 your opinion than it does a neutral position, which is like your the position you expressed in your email is something I agree with very uh, explicitly. That uh, including attribution elements will go certainly against uh, privacy and anonymity and freedom of expression, which are the other rights we've expressed. So uh, very happy to uh, incorporate the text Mallory suggested. Uh, I, I also think that that uh, that merits inclusion as a general note and uh, is perhaps applicable to certain other questions in the, in the draft as well, uh, and not particularly uh, restricted to the attribution question. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to change it to a more uh, neutral text, but I, I was under the impression that like this text was uh, uh, in, in fact uh, reflecting your opinion more closely and of, of the group. But uh, yeah, I, I feel like we're getting uh, into the weeds too much again. And uh, if it is, uh, I, I mean, I leave it up to the chest to, uh, as to how to uh, uh, approach this question in the meeting. Okay. Okay. To facilitate the discussion, I put the text in the chat and I think the addition that uh, Gorshabal is talking about is towards the end that uh, that explicitly says considering the adverse impact of attribution on the right to privacy and freedom of expression enabling attribution on an individual level is probably not consistent with human rights so I think this uh, 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 that's there and I think that was your opinion right Fars? so we can add a, a sentence that we should do more work on it but I'm not sure that we make will make this work this document clearer. So I can definitely say we can put it on a work plan to do more work on it. But I'm not sure adding that to this document will make it clearer. But happy to consider any other text that you'd like to have in there. Good to continue this discussion on the list. But we have Elliot and Colin, whose names were both invoked, who we should give a chance to speak, and then we should really move the discussion to the list. I think. Okay, so I just put the proposed change to the list, and there are two changes if, if, if you take a look, right? The, the first is we, we take out the word probably. I think probably is, is probably uh, problematic because either something is supported or it's not supported. And we can say may as in the idea of this, this, this um, uh, this might be a problem that is worthy of further uh, research. Or we can say it is, in which case we can cite it, and we can take out the word may and just say it is. Um, and, and that's fine, too. Uh, the second part of this is that uh, we didn't want to overgeneralize in terms of that attribution impacts all human rights. It's these particular human rights that we were talking about. And that was the, the so those were the two changes. I don't think the latter change is at all controversial. Um, I think the former change is, is easily resolvable as well. All we have to do is, if, if you can cite that, yeah, attribution is problematic, and I could, perfect, I could perfectly reasonably believe that it is problematic. You know, if, 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 um, if somebody can tie back to me some of the things that I said um, and, and that are illegal in a particular country, I could imagine that it's very problematic. So um, uh, I, I, I think it just helps to be more definitive. I, I apologize for taking quite so long to say that, all that. Thank you, Elliot. And Colin? Hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm sure um, Fasnay's um, memory is accurate, but I, I have to admit to, to not recalling the, the specific comment uh, that, that she was referring to. Uh, uh, I mean, for, for the record, I, I'm not waiting for any specific text changes to this document, uh, and uh, I, I will let the, the chair's judge uh, consensus. 
Uh, so uh, if, if, uh, if I accidentally gave the impression that I was, then, then uh, my, my apologies. Uh, that, that's certainly not the case. Thank you, Colin. I, I was just treating it as another participant's viewpoint that needed to be taken into account. I, I wasn't a uh, uh, assuming an IRTF chair um, mandate, but thank you. Um, okay. Are we, so Gershwin Bhatt, are you okay on this? And as I say, other people, let's continue this discussion on the list. The list gets deadly quiet sometimes, and then it flurries, and then it gets deadly quiet. So really, I would like to see this one resolved there as much as we can before Gershwin Bhatt and, and Niels put out another version, which I hope is the one that we can take the last call. And I will be trying to check with people that made comments to see where they're at on the resolution of their comments. Okay. But if we now still have opinions, it would be great to hear them now and then we can continue. But so we'll keep monitoring the chats. But it sounds now like we have pretty much what we want with Elliot Solution. So that's great. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I think we see the and I don't know if we've crossed it yet. Uh, and just quickly to follow Thanks up. Thanks so much, Steve. Yes, Colin. Just to follow up from looking at the chat, it seems that we were confusing Perkinses. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, Back to Mallory. I'll, I'll go invisible. Great. My co pilot and I would like to invite Niels. Niels, great. This is on draft association. We can yeah. see you, Niels, yeah. and your slides, and we can hear you. Go ahead. Excellent. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, uh, it is great that we're all here to talk about uh, freedom of association. And it's nice after we've been talking about participation in groups that we now get to talk about the, uh, the draft on association and the internet infrastructure. Uh, I've been working on this with uh, Gisela Perez de Acha, with Stefan Couture, and with Mallory Nodal, which is funny because these are people who associate together with all different mother tongues, which is uh, interesting. The objective for this dog is to uh, expand and deepen relations between a specific right and protocols. And this is the uh, explicit objective uh, from the chat charter. And so a non-objective for this doc is to analyze specific protocols to do human rights impact assessment or to produce new guidelines, such as those done in the previous document. Uh, so a short summary of how we've been working on this. So we've been working on this since March 2017, so it has its uh, uh, four years anniversary. It has been a, uh, a research group document since September 2018 and authors from academia and civil society and from different geographies and disciplines have contributed to it. And that also sometimes shifted the structure and the uh, topic of the document, which sometimes made it a bit like a um, accordion, but uh, it definitely made a good sound at, uh, at times. And we had many reviews from many IRTF and IETF uh, participants, as well as legal experts, and we actually might hear from some in a bit. So what happened since uh, 06, we've been reading more literature and getting extensive reviews, which is great. Um, because this is a research group document, uh, I think we need to keep in mind that we all have change control on this document. And uh, 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 so tech suggestions are great, but if people say, go here, re read these 10 papers and divide, divide and get, a, uh, get something from that that I want, that is, perhaps uh, 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 not the best way to approach a group document. And it would also be great if we can keep the threads uh, 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 linking to each other on the mailing list so we can keep track of the comments so we cannot get anyone's uh, useful and a very important contributions lost. So what we've been doing is address the full reviews. So we make clearer distinctions between the rights to association and the right to assembly. We added recent decision documents and documents from relevant UN bodies. We added more context and nuance where there were unclarities. 
We added examples and concrete considerations and improved the conclusions. Um, uh, then uh, some proposed changes for our next version because this week people have been emailing and I uh, 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 and uh, 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 and I think some with some very good suggestions. So we should more clearly differentiate the right to assembly and right to association association in the beginning and then also provide the definitions for both rights. So I'd like to do that directly on top and uh, show that they're different. And then we can discuss them in uh, combination later because then they are uh, extended. And add an emphasis that the document is about human rights as per the HRPC charter and not their implementation in national laws. But I do think it is very uh, uh, relevant to get that stuff, but not maybe in this document, because then this document might never see the, uh, uh, the finish line. So uh, uh, that will be my proposal to go forward. And uh, uh, any comments and questions are extremely welcome. I just wanted to make my own comment that um, I also agree uh, that we need to point to possible future work. Niels, if you could meet. Um, like national laws and applications, but that this document is really still in the baby stage just trying to establish a key relationship so that future work has the ability to stand on top of this. That's like, it's incredibly important that we do all the things, but in sort of order. Yes, and I then my second thing was to invite Lisa uh, to talk, who's given a really great review and is engaging on the list currently as well. So go ahead, Lisa, you should be able to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hey, yes, can you hear me well? Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I'm, I'm happy to contribute to this discussion and um, was really happy to look, do a full review of the latest draft and uh, contribute to the next draft. I'm very enthusiastic about the conclusions and the improvements and um, there are still some improvements possible as Niels just mentioned uh, based on like making the, the the freedoms more explicitly different from each other I had some some uh, um, some thoughts that I wanted to share with you during this mission maybe also sharing a little bit about the background for my contribution so what I um, there were two aspects that I that we focused on at ICNL. I'm at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. I think I'm the only non-lawyer in that organization. So I have interesting discussions with my colleagues about freedoms of association and assembly and what falls within the scope and outside the scope. And what I try to do is to always keep in mind that very detailed legal texts are often pretty difficult and sometimes or even scary to understand for non-legal people. So uh, <laughs> it's um, uh, um, let's say that I had a discussion about how there, how the paragraphs about freedom of association and freedom of of assembly were written in this paper, and. Um, also related to the comments made by by Professor Brahman, it's. It is possible to really go in depth into these these freedoms, but I'm not sure if it is really worthwhile for the for the goal of this paper because um, while there it's important to make some of the disclaimers that is an ongoing discussion, especially how these rights apply in in cyberspace and um, how digitally mediated assemblies, what that is, for example, and how they should protect it. This is an ongoing discussion, and it's important to have the references to to this discussion, but to really go to in-depth jurisprudence or uh, interpretations in national laws, I'm not sure if that is really um, uh, helpful to make a point um, in this paper. So, um, because I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, because I'm not a lawyer, I focus a little bit more on identifying and 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 really updating the the normative language that has been developed over the time, and pretty recently actually. So I think four years has been a great time to work on this because you actually allowed the Human Rights Committee to come up with their general comments on freedom of assemblies, that was published end of last year, and they. Um, this is really the latest authoritative text in terms of 
UN language that we should refer to in this in this paper, and that's what I try to, to try to include in the latest draft. So um, what I think is interesting, maybe for this for this uh, call and to tap um, your knowledge, is that um, I wanted to highlight some of the this um, general remarks by the Human Rights Committee um, that. I haven't been able to understand completely whether they are related to something, whether they are related to protocol design or not. So I just wanted to highlight three different um, uh, um, phrases from the from the general comments and ask for ask whether you have anything to to add to that. So. Um, The paper says, the general comment says, like, first it says, associated activities that happen online or otherwise rely upon digital services are protected. I think that is in general a very important notion, but still very general. Um, it also says, technologies that offer the opportunity to assemble either wholly or partly online are should be protected. And uh, technologies that play an integral role in organizing, participating, and monitoring physical gatherings. So um, it's not. I'm not. I'm not uh, able to really translate that into protocol design. So if someone can also like highlight this, or maybe later in the email, that's that would be so um, welcome for me also to learn. And um, another important aspect of international human rights law, of course, is that the, res the, the boundaries for restrictions on international law are, are formulated. So um, the general comments mention some of the restrictions that actually should, that happen, but should be limited, um, uh, that are not, not uh, uh, in line with the international law and with the tests that are, are developed for, for restrictions. So they mention, Restrictions of operation of information dissemination systems. I think that's super gener generic um, and requires further thinking, but I was just wondering how is this related to protocol design? And they also mentioned action that block or hinder internet connectivity in relation to peaceful assemblies. So is that really the opportunity to use your phone and share videos on online platforms or is it something else or really participate in a mailing list while you're at a protest or preparing a protest um i find that um interesting to to think about what it means and what it what it implicates for protocol design it also has um explicitly mentioned geo targeted or technology specific interference with connectivity or access to content and activities of internet service providers and intermediaries that restrict assemblies or the privacy of assembly participants. So um, that's it for the legal language from, uh, from, from me. And I'm just really happy to be here in this community now. And uh, any, any further re replies to this uh, are super welcome. And I look forward to continue to work with, uh, with the draft. Thank you. No, thank you very much. This is exactly the sort of thing we need for HRPC drafts. It's like we really would need um, reviews from outside the immediate um, sector and audience. Um, yeah, go ahead, Niels. Yeah, I, I just wanted to thank Lisa again because the uh, um, uh, because the comments were just so good and uh, both in the document and now again so we can take the definitions from there without uh, uh, using other sources that we can use authoritative human rights language from the source where we cite from that's uh, that's great and that we should definitely help uh, make the next steps for the document so thanks so much for being here thanks so much for commenting and thanks so much for also conferring with your uh, legal colleagues and making the document better thanks so much so putting my chair hat on for a second, because I authored part of this draft for a short amount of time, um, just wanting to make sure everything has been resolved. We obviously cannot, San Sandra uh, Brahman, who has written to the list a few times about this draft, isn't on the call, but I wanted to think about how to get to the point where we've resolved that when I think a lot of those questions, again, okay, so putting my author hat on for a hot second, a lot of those suggestions feel very out of scope 
taking my hat off again. Um, like how to then actually resolve that. I just feel like it has sort of proven to be a bit of a endless back and forth where there's some cross talking. Aubrey, you're on, what do you think we should do? I, I, uh, well, uh, for, I, I don't think it's been going on long enough for it to be an endless discussion. Um, and so I, I'm hoping to see a, a little bit more, you know, discussion go on, on on the list, especially when it, it gets a little further. I think, again, you're right. We'll have to do that division between what is actually directly pertinent to association. And I'm starting to think that somewhere or other I've got a shepherd's hat for taking this through its last call since you're an author, but, you know, have that. But it's, we're not quite there yet. So I think there's room for some further discussion. You know, I, I think some of the new input that's come in is really great. And and so I think this one is starting to get close, but I do think there's this more discussion. And as I said, I think there's still the division between what is the theoretical background and how much of that needs to be in in this sort of first big work on the association uh, theme. And yeah. so. Well, for one, for maybe we can just discuss like one of the most recent ones that Neil's also talked about in the slides. It's like, here are 10 primary source documents that might inform you. I feel like Stefan and others did a very comprehensive lit review already that spanned six to 12 months. So if there's that much source material that we're missing, I actually think we need to get to the heart of the comment and start another document because it, it cannot be, I feel, that we've missed so very much and are still within the same scope of the same document. I think the reason why it appears that we've missed so much is that there's a vision for this document that is different from what the authors have envisioned. And it's that's totally fine. That happens all the time. And it's actually a gift because in some ways we've got the beginnings of another piece of research for HRPC to work on. Um, but again, because this is like trying to you know, establish a sort of baseline relationship that it does not else doesn't not exist elsewhere as a real contribution to the space. I think we should keep it to um, achieving that very one clear goal that's in our charter, trying to make that as solid as it can be to indicate other peripheral work and then follow that work from the beginning properly. Yeah, I, I think that's probably true. I think it's probably, and, and I very much take Niels's comment of, don't tell me to go read these 10 books, but, you know, give me some specific text, give me some specific pointers for where something that, as you say, fits within the context. It's really fun seeing her in the background. I keep smiling and wanting to wave hello. Um, but so oh, I think... It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I, I think that trying to, to cut to get that line because it is a, a research group document of where exactly is the constraining line on this document and the beginning line on another is still at least for me a little fuzzy. So I'd really like to try and I'd really like to hear from some other people and I'm so glad to see Elliot's name show up. And but one thing before we go there, we had an any other business topic on the list that we're not going to get to on the agenda, and I'm going to suggest, and especially since Sandra's not here anyway, I'm going to suggest an interim meeting. So let's not worry about that. Elliot. Yeah, I, I, I think part of the issue to, to address um, the point that Mallory just made, and it, that there are different visions, the IRTF was established to, uh, to allow for that. Um, it's, it's perfectly fine to have different conflicting visions, in fact. Um, and, and I think that's okay. Um, but what I think a few of, I have to come back to what a few of us have, have been scratching our heads about. There's no need for these documents, if there's conflicting visions, there's no need for them to be consensus documents. It, it, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to go forward with without that without going for that strong consensus. It, 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 you're not under the IETF constraints, and, and, and you shouldn't tie your hands in that way, is, is my view. 
You know, if people want to disagree, it's okay. As long as the work is, is of a certain level of scholarly, you know, standard, if, if it meets the scholarship standard, good. If it's missing the scholarship standard, that's more of an issue. But, but if, if people have different points of view and they're, if they're expressing it through good scholarly work, just let a thousand blossoms, you know, go, as, as they say, you know, grow. I'd see no reason to hold this document up beyond that point, you know, just so long as we're clear that it's, it's not going to be a consensus document. And I think that's a, a, something that will help you guys advance. Elliot, Elliot, I, can, I, can. I think there's a differentiation between two things. One is what is the purpose of the document and how far do we go in it? And the other is differences of opinion on particular points that are included in the document. I think everyone pretty much accepts your view that the document itself doesn't need to be a consensus opinion, but we do need to reach a certain amount of consensus about the scope of the document that the research group, so it doesn't end up an encyclopedia. It ends up a document directed towards a specific point. And I think those two issues are, are a little different, but happy to keep talking to you about that one on the list. Colin, please. Uh, I don't know how many buttons I'm pressing. I'm really not trying to share my screen here. Um, I mean, I, I, I do think uh, Elliot made some some good points there. Uh, I mean, that you know, so, some documents are, are consensus documents, uh, uh, and it's important that they're consensus documents. Uh, uh, and other documents can cannot be consensus documents and can express a, a minority view, providing it's clear what the document is uh, and provided it's um, you know, a, a well, well reasoned, well argument, well argued uh, view. Um, I think the, the other um, comment I, I think I want to make was it, you know, if, if a document is, you know, gets um, such quite extensive feedback, um, you know, like it did, and the 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 office then turn around and say, well, well, that that's all great, but it's out of scope. Um, then that perhaps suggests that um, that it's not clear what the scope of the document is, um, and um, you know, may, maybe the the scope of the document should expand to include that that feedback. Or maybe the scope should be clarified, um, uh, just just so everyone sort of looks at it and says, you, you know, that that that's fine, but it's it's not for this document. Um, so it, I think um, just just saying um, that's fine, but it's out of scope um, may be okay, but it would I think need some extensive, perhaps moderately extensive changes to the document to make the scope clearer. Um, or it should be addressing those comments. Thanks. Um, Mallory, you want it? Yeah, I'm in the queue as, a, as an author. So I, um, I think that it would be useful. I, I totally agree with you, Colin. I think I said before, like, it's going to, to say it's out of scope isn't an, an enough. Like, we, we should try to figure out a way to point to other research. I think before we can incorporate a sentence or a paragraph of that in the current draft. I mean, we can definitely strengthen the scope, but then in terms of like leading to other drafts, we would need, I think someone, if not Sandra herself, to step in and try to summarize what would the research question of the other document be. I cannot as co-author or co-chair of the group find the time to help make that document happen. So it's a call and a request to the group to distill what's been there, what's been shared into a very clear research question that leads into another document in such a way that we can point to that future work in the draft that we have now and to set it up so that it can then get knocked down, right? And that's what I hope um, we can do, but I just feel like I can't personally make that happen. And I just, I mean, if we can direct Sandra to do it, that'd be great. But I suspect that we also need um, other folks who maybe yet haven't helped author drafts in HRPC or if, if I, I saw comments to Sandra's um, emails where they found them very enlightening and that's taught them a lot. I and Especially if it's going to focus on national laws, like to get folks actually based in nations where we're going to be taking 
cues um, from them, that would be really helpful uh, to be co-authors and to try to actually make this happen. So I think that's where we should go with this to try to resolve um, the current association draft. So that's, I'm done now. Thanks. And obviously, since you're an author and a co-chair, I'll have to take more responsibility to try and enable that. Uh, Lisa and Niels, Lisa next, then Niels, and we have six minutes. Thank you. I'll keep it short. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of of the scope and the goal of the of the paper, um, I think it can be strengthened by really. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's possible, but COVID-19 has showed that every kind of form of association and assembly has this very important online um, aspect to it, much more than, for example, two or three or four years ago now. So it can be, uh, this This really heightens the relevance of the paper, and I think it's important to really strengthen, that was also one of the points by, by Sandra Berman, to really strengthen the examples and tie them to what is actually protected under international human rights law and what is not. And to also really present a disclaimer that this is not uh, uh, a finalized discussion because it's not, but it's good to have a point in time where there's really more awareness and more guidelines for and conclusions for for people working on the internet architecture that are maintaining this super important digital infrastructure that we know to continue assembling and, and convening in digital time. So, thank you. Thank you. And Niels, you get the last word on this topic today. Thanks so much. I think the, uh, Juliana made a great point in the chat. This is part of uh, an interdisciplinary conversation, um, which is always challenging. But what I think it's even more, it's part of a very long discussion of which some people that came in at the end have not been part. And we really spend a long time on building consensus in the group on what this scope of this document should be. Then we completely reorganized it and worked on it for a long and hard time with Stefan, with students, with binding cases, with building the research structure. And then we had consensus on it. And now uh, Sandra would, came in and would like to change it, which I think is great. But that makes the discussion and the process also a bit problematic. So I fully agree that we should try to make the scope of this document clearer put the definition at the beginning and what it does and what it doesn't do and then i really hope that we can have another document that further discussions on implementations and then combining guidelines and other stuff but i think we should also try to keep our output going because that also keeps it inciting for people to work on stuff and i do hope that we can thank you thank you I I'll, I'll try to help with that and i turn it back to you mallory for the last three minutes I don't even think I'll take three, but I just, I will, Niels makes a really important point, which is that we actually, one of the ways that we, re, we decided to work on this draft was to be genuinely curious and to conduct research to answer questions that we didn't know the answers to yet. And that is what has led to this draft. And I think the reason why we aren't including national laws and things that Sandra is is because we, from the beginning, we didn't look there. When we said we're gonna first conduct a lit review and then we're going to come up with sub questions and then we're going to answer those sub questions with examples and analysis, we, from the beginning, limited ourselves to human rights and international human rights law. So that's why it's not there. And I can totally understand why there are some very curious uh, questions and issues that need to be scratched that touch on this issue. And I'm so glad that this draft has inspired those questions, but they just simply are not what we set out to do. And I think just reminding that and then as a way to, um, you know, facilitate then that research that has been inspired by this draft, like we just need to make that happen. And I'm really invested in doing that as a chair. So um, I think then the end is near. We had a really great session, huge appreciation to all of the presenters, the authors, the discussants. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Avery. Um, yeah, have a really good rest of your IETF 110. Uh, maybe we'll see you in San Francisco. Probably we'll still see you online, uh, at least some of you. So yeah, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. A last thing a I want to add is
out on the list, on the list, scheduling a a uh, an intermediate meeting so that we can get into the discussion of continuing work and what work is on our list. Some of the stuff in Sandra's message that was quite good. Some of the stuff that comes out of the two drafts we've talked about of what the next step is in those discussions. So again, thank you all, and you'll be hearing from me.